Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on its usual Monday for a debut of a new episode. I'm the great Brian Last, your host. I'm feeling all right, about 95%. And the man who will be answering your questions like he does each and every week, the star of the drive through I don't know what percentage he's feeling right now, but Mr. Jim Cornette. Jim, how are you today? First of all, don't try to fucking suck up, Mr. 95 fucking percent. I'm f- I got the other five. I'm still about the other 5%. Secondly, I was going to make a pithy comment about something you just said, and I've forgotten it because I'm dizzy from a goddamn <laughs> coughing fit. Thirdly, um, if we if they weren't our friends, we wouldn't have done the last three fucking shows, either one of us. Uh, the way we felt. And you 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 went down after me and you're nipping up before me. I know you're 20 years younger than me, uh, but I, mine was worse overall, although I wasn't going to Europe all the time like you were. You know, it's, uh, the, it's the granola. It's the, no. uh, it's the caffeine. I have a good mixture of things that get me motivated. You know, one time we were doing local promos for Crockett. He got some TV up in upstate New York, and we weren't going to run Ithaca, but if the promo was because the town was in Ithaca, and they'd give me the fucking generic promos, right? Three minutes speaking generically about nothing because they knew I could, A, I could do it, and B, you know, they liked to see me fucking do all that extra work. Shivani, sometimes Shivani would just, he'd be standing there in a fucking suit jacket and a shirt and tie and baggy shorts and flip-flops because they only shot him from the waist up. And every once in a while, he on those three minute long things where I'm just ranting and raving because I've got absolutely nothing to talk about, just filling the three minutes of the local promo time. He'd give me the Iggy and the ribs, and I'd take the microphone and he'd walk off and sit down. And I'm just standing there in my set, and everybody's watching me. One time they turned the goddamn, uh, there was a clock, a, 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 an actual clock that you could see in front of you, a countdown clock. They would hit at two minutes, 59 seconds when we started. Jackie Crockett would hit it. And that way you could see where you were and you knew to end on zero, right? One time I'm doing three minutes generically about nothing and I'm into it and I don't want to stop and do it all over again now. And Shivani gives me the fucking Iggy and I know he's going to hand me the microphone. So I take the fucking microphone and I'm still talking and Shivani's sitting there. And then I see everybody else is sitting there. Jackie Crockett has walked away from the camera. The camera's just locked down on a shot of me. He's sitting there and he's, he's pulled the plug on the clock. So I don't know. I said, finally, I talked for like four minutes because I didn't want to fucking do it again. And I, I, I finally, I said, what more do you want from me? You motherfuckers, right? Just a rib to see how, how long that go. But anyway, as I was saying clearly and succinctly earlier, you went down <laughs> after me. You've come up before me. I'm still fucking ill. I, I I don't know what the fuck I caught. I've I, I, now I've I'm clearing out the nose. The the severe nosebleeds are clearing out my nasal con- congestion, and I've only got intermittent croupiness in my chest. But I'm I've been never been so weak, and I've slept. I usually sleep six hours a night now that I've gotten older. Right? I got to get up and piss, and it's over with. I'm up for the day, and and. I just, I don't sleep as much as I used to. And I'm always got to be busy during the day because I've always got things to do, whether it's filling orders or doing things for Cornette's collectibles or or doing things for my other projects or just working on the the house or my collections, whatever. I got to be doing something. I've slept 12 hours each night the last two nights after I got off the fucking meth or the Sudafed. And and I, I still I should be well rested, and I'm still dragging around like I'm zombified. Try I'm trying to f- pack these packages. If anybody has emailed me and said where's my shit over the last two weeks, the reason why I haven't answered emails is because I'm trying to send you your shit. So there you have it. It's a double edged sword. I'm raving now, aren't I? Ranting and raving. It's Robin Leach with lifestyles of the rich and famous. I'm screaming, and I don't know why. <laughs> Did you like that show? Did you watch that show? I didn't. I thought that show was bullshit. That was early reality television. I've always hated. I like television. It's real and hate reality television because there's nothing faker than reality TV. Well, hold on. It wasn't real. The only thing they- I can watch anymore is documentaries. I guess that's why I'm smarter than most people because I learn things. It wasn't real when they went to Ted DiBiase's winter residence. Yeah. It, it, it just, <laughs> as opposed to his summer home in Shively. 
Um, yeah, only the Louisville area fans are going to get that one, but boy, it's a rip snorter. If you know, fucking Kentucky and a geography, you know, we got to start off the program on a sad note. One of the best workers I've just been on the internet waiting for you. Cause you've been ill and behind and just got our other show up. We do so many of these things. Um, I was on the internet. One of the best workers of the television era of all television just, just died on what February 8th. What was Saturday, right? Um, have you seen this? One of the best workers? No, I have no idea. One of the best workers of the television era. Robert Conrad, 84 years old. I did see that. I, when you said worker, I was thinking. No. Of the television he, era. Who's he talking about? Ricky Starr? Who's left out there? <clears throat> no, Robert Conrad, even though he was not a professional wrestler, and I've mentioned this before, was one of the best workers of the television era. Physically, one of the best workers. And now that I'm reading a, 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 a bunch of his bio, I know why. Uh, but one of my favorite shows when I was a kid to the point I, I own the complete, you know, set on DVD, The Wild Wild West. I was a kid when when that show was on network television, 1965 to 1970. And it was one of my favorite shows because not only it was James Bond meets the Western, right? Because the Westerns were hot. Bonanza, Gunsmoke, every, the top 20 shows on television were Westerns. But this was a science fiction Western with two Secret Service men that worked for President Grant in their own private fucking you know, railroad car in the 1880s battling, you know, Dr. Miguelito Loveless, Michael Dunn, the, you know, midget star who was one of the coolest heels ever. And, and they had all the gadgets and he had the fucking Derringer that popped out of his sleeve and he had the knife he could throw from his jacket uh, collar pocket in the back of his head and all the goddamn you know, gimmicks and, and the, the, the inventions that they came up with and the heels. It was just, it was an incredible science fiction Western. Of course, they made a movie of it with Will Smith and fucked the whole thing up. The movie bombed and it was garbage. Awful. Um, but Robert Conrad to me was the man. I always, I wanted a Jim West outfit. I never had a Jim West body, but boy, he looked badass with that short jacket and the form fitting, you know, shit and the fucking hat. It wasn't a cowboy hat like fucking Hoss Cartwright. It was a cool fucking Western hat <laughs> and the and the boots and everything with the fucking, you know, weapons in them and the heel and all that stuff. Um, and, and now and also here's here's the point I was going to make. The reason why he's the best worker, one of the best workers of television era now with the advent of slow mo. And and knowing what I know now, I always loved the fight scenes because they were better fight scenes. Even when I was a kid, I could tell hokiness in television fight scenes. And the Westerns always had the fight scenes. But it, the Rifleman, Chuck Connors was pretty good, but you could still see some shit going on. And especially anybody on Bonanza that ever got in a goddamn fight, you know, they cut to the wide shot and there it's obvious stunt men. And William Shatner likes to think he was a badass, but I, you know, I see a bunch of Star Trek fights where, you know, he's, he's doing some of his shit, but not the big stuff. Robert Conrad was taking bumps off the goddamn second level of the fucking saloon. He was going through the railings. And it, when I was a kid, I said, this is, this guy's a badass, right? I was watching people work before I even had ever seen wrestling and quantifying the quality of their performance in my head before I knew how they were doing it. <clears throat> but it, you know, that's the thing is Robert Conrad now with the advent of all the slow-mo and, and I've got the DVDs and I can frame by frame, you can tell he's doing almost all of his shit and probably he wanted to do all of it. But in some cases, the insurance on the television program, you're the star, motherfucker. You're not going to fall off a 30-foot cliff, right? I know that's the way television works. Uh, too bad it's not the way wrestling works. <clears throat> but, um, but, you know, he was doing almost all of his own shit, and he was in great shape. Well, come to find out, he was a pro boxer. He had a, wait a minute, I'm going back up to his boxing record. Uh, it's, or maybe back down to his boxing record. Goddamn, wherever the fuck. It, yes. Football player in school at 18, he was hired to drive milk wagons. So that was 60 something years ago. I remember when the milkman used to come to my house, but I digress. He looked nothing like me though. For those of you who are going for that joke. Um, and he was a pro boxer. Uh, I think I saw one article. He had a record of like four, one and one or whatever. And then when he moved to Hollywood, he was a stunt man. 
so he knew how to do all that shit. Plus he was such a good looking guy. Plus he was a good actor. So he was a total package. He was a great fucking worker. Looked like a star, worked like a star, acted like a star and kept his fucking gimmick up. Um, you know, from, uh, uh, Hawaii and I and, and Baba Black Sheep, the Black Sheep Squadron, right? TV show. He actually learned how to fly to play a, a fighter pilot. He was fucking dedicated. <clears throat> but anyway, I love this part of this story in the Washington Post because I'm thinking this is a guy that I idolized when I was a kid and didn't even know why, right? Throughout Hollywood, Mr. Conrad had a reputation as a tough customer and was sued more than a half dozen times as a result of fist fights. Playing himself in a 1999 episode of the TV series, Just Shoot Me, he lampooned his threatening tough guy persona, uh, blah, blah, blah. He said, I'm only about five foot eight and only weigh 165 pounds as of this morning, so I'm not the world's meanest guy, he told an interviewer in 2008. If you treat me nicely, I'll treat you nicer. If you're rude to me, put your headgear on. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> and his daughter said, dad is a hard worker. If people drag their feet, he gets impatient. He starts ranting and raving. It takes a while to patiently take him aside and show him why things might not be going well. These were my heroes when I was there. There was real men on television back in those days, not these fucking sissies today. Do you remember when he, one of my favorite Robert Conrad stories, when he called up Larry King during the big UFC debate in like 95, 96, probably 96. It was Bob Myrowitz, my old friend. Yes. And I think he had Ken Shamrock on his side debating against John McCain, who was all about banning mixed martial arts. Oh, well, yeah. Human cockfighting. No holds barred fighting. It wasn't even mixed martial arts yet. Yeah. And I think even Mark Ratner, who later went on to work for the UFC, but at that point was, I think, maybe the head of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. He was on John McCain's side. And they're going back and forth. And all of a sudden, Larry King is like, we have Robert Conrad on the phone. And it's like, wow, what's what's going on? And he gets on. He's like, yeah, hi, John. Worry about balancing the budget. <laughs> like, you, don't to, you don't have to worry about this. <laughs> and uh, Bob told me after the fact, like he invited Robert Conrad to a UFC. I don't know if he ever went, but he, you know, he invited him. He said, we really appreciate you calling up and defending us. But I thought that was really cool that in the middle of this whole thing, Robert Conrad calls in to yell at John McCain. Don't even yell at him, but just say. Why are you wasting your time with this? Go! I remember the line, balance the budget. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Robert Conrad, by God. I'm, you know, now that's the kind of guy you would want to got into business. If, if, they, if they want to use celebrities in fucking wrestling business. That's, you know, if, if, if the times were different and his prime was the celebrity era of wrestling, that's the kind of guy you might want to get into fucking wrestling business. What'd you think when Shatner, were you there when Shatner, were you on Raw yes. when Shatner showed up? Yes, yes. And Star Trek was my favorite show when I was a kid. Also, I'm way more Star Trek than Star Wars. But when I heard that Robert Conrad was going to monkey flip fucking Jerry Lawler. Well, Shatner, not Conrad. Or I'm sorry, William Shatner. Yes, I'm sorry. I apologize, Robert. When I heard William Shatner was going to monkey flip Jerry Lawler, I'm like, well, fuck. Now here's another fucking childhood hero of mine that I'm mad at. You know, it, and then you find out that, you know, everybody else on the set hated William Shatner and fucking George Takai that he was a prick and blah, 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 and all that other stuff. And, and you, can, you can see that. And even though he mocks himself, supposedly, in, later, in his later years now, Shatner. But, you know. You ever hear that audio of him? Stern used to play it. I also had a tape of it before I think even Howard was playing it. It was on a CD that was put out. Oh, you, you and Stern are on first name basis now. Huh? Well, we're both from the South Shore. So any, yeah, okay. any weird Jewish kids from the South Shore of Long Island, we're on a first name basis. But uh, it was called Celebrities at, our wor at Their Worst. And one of the things was William Shatner recording audio, I think, for the Star Trek cartoon. And he kept saying, Mr. Spock, sabotage the system. Sabotage. And, and you hear the director go, can you say sabotage? He goes, no, I don't say sabotage. You say sabotage. I say sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> Just so difficult for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and I bet Robert Conrad could have kicked the shit out of William Shatner, too. And that would have been an interesting fight lately because Robert Conrad was 84. Shatner's what, 88? I'd have liked to, I bet Conrad could really fucking take him now. Would have said, watch anyway. the wig. 
Oh my God, that and that's another thing. If you go back and you, Shatner has more hair now than he did sixty years ago. <laughs> It's just fucking embarrassing. And I look at a picture of Robert Conrad, and he's gray-headed, looks like Uncle, from a few years ago, looks like Uncle Creepy. He's gray and straggly. He didn't give a fuck. He's like, fuck it, I'm a man. You know, I don't wear wigs. Uh, whatever happened uh, to Ross Martin? Is Ross Martin gone? He was older than Jim West. Artemis Gordon. Yeah, I don't know. He has to be. Well, let's just fucking look it up. <laughs> you know the other. You just t- tell the people what this program is supposed to be about, and I'm going to look up and see what's happened to Artemis Gordon. This program is about answering your questions. Eventually, at some point, they're sent in a number of ways, and sometimes a number of times, to corny drive through at gmail.com or on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. We try to find the best ones each and every week. And wait for everyone to complain about Charlie from Starkville, Mississippi, getting his questions on the air. Well, this is troubling. Uh Uh-oh. Apparently, Ross Martin has been dead for 39 years. He died in 1981. He was only 61 years old at the time. Artemis Gordon didn't make it 12 years after after fucking... Uh, uh, Wild Wild West went off the air, and he looked like he was he was he was only forty five through fifty when the show was on the air. Obviously, he was older than than Jim West. He was the sidekick, but still, what the fuck? Sixty one years old. I'm fifty eight. Fuck! I don't even want to do the show now. <laughs> well, we I have to do the it. show. We've committed to at he least was, this episode. Well, <sighs> this is troubling. What the fuck did he die of? Does it say? Wait a minute. We're hold on. Early life, career, Wild Wild West, huge fucking on the Wild Wild. Oh, wait, and wait a minute. In 1968, you know, do you remember when there was a time where Artemis was on assignment or whatever, and Jim got different partners? Apparently, in 1968, Martin broke his leg and then suffered a near fatal heart attack forcing the Wild Wild West to replace him with other actors, including Charles Aidman, William Shallert, and Alan Hale Jr. for nine episodes. Uh, he was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series for the fourth and final season of the Wild Wild West. Uh, the series was canceled in 1969 in the midst of a national controversy over violence on television. Apparently there were pussies then, too. Um, but son of a bitch, yet yeah, death suffered a fatal heart attack after a game of tennis. What are your thoughts on some of the replacements? From that era of television, like when Bub, when they replaced Bub with, was it Uncle Charlie? Yeah, William Demarest. Yeah, well, you know, you, you Mr. Wilson died you, on. You got Dennis well, you got to do what you got to do when somebody dies. All the, and and actually, I, because I I caught the reruns of the William Frawley My Three Sons and had seen uh, on network first when I started watching My Three Sons William Demarest. So it was a little jarring. I got the second guy first. But, you know, they've tried to make excuses for years for, you know, the second Darren on Bewitched, and it was only because Dick York had the bad back and health problems that he had to be replaced. But for heaven's sake, Dick Sargent, come on. You just couldn't know. Once that Darren had, had – Dick York had become Darren, you couldn't accept another Darren. But getting back to the goddamn important thing, Ross Martin suffered a fatal heart attack. That's right. After playing tennis. Well, you'll never see me on a goddamn tennis court. <laughs> I'll never pick up Fuck a it, racket I'll, again. Hit a mo- I'll hit a motherfucker in the head with a racket, but I ain't going to play any tennis. He looked like the fucking picture of health. I don't know. Boy, here's another thing about, about Robert Conrad. You know, there was a picture of him with his second wife not long ago or 10 years ago or whatever. She looked like she was about 40 years younger than Robert Conrad. I knew I liked him for a variety of reasons. Well, anyway, what the fuck? Well, now that's just depressing. All right. If you want to sue because you have, you somebody in your family <laughs> has had a fatal heart attack while playing a game of tennis, if you want to sue because your favorite television character has been replaced by some putts, if you'd like to sue because a coronavirus-infected former wrestling manager has not fulfilled your merchandise orders in the last 10 days. Although stuff is actually has been shipped and is contained by the time you hear this, almost all of it will have been shipped. 
Uh, so please have patience. If you want to, if you just want to just piss somebody the fuck off and fuck their life up, I can tell you right now who can fuck a motherfucker up better than any motherfucker on the fucking planet. Call Stephen P. show or two. Those are the rest. I don't think it's any news. I don't think it's breaking news or a big bulletin that if somebody has fucked you around some kind of way, Stephen P. New will fuck their world up. That may be the possibly the most bizarre advertisement for a <laughs> legal firm I think that so. has ever been uttered, but I'm in that kind of mood here the past week or two, folks, in my deathbed. But in all honesty, we've talked about all the charity work he's done. We've talked about all the work he's done for opio opio I'll try that again. Opioid addicted <laughs> babies. We've talked about all the work he's done for people whose families have been harmed in some way by negligence and greed and avarice on behalf of the big corporations. But let's just cut to the to the fact of the matter. If somebody has has done something bad to you and they have broken the law while they have done it, he will fuck them up. And I can testify to that personally. Um, he's undefeated. He's O for life as far as defeats in my fucking personal business as over, over outlaw mud shows or not. So uh, we've had testimony from Cult of Cornet members that have uh, retained him for their various cases. We've ev even had testimony from an attorney, another attorney inside the Cult of Cornet who does not handle that type of cases, who refers those cases to Stephen. So he's got professional uh, recommendations there. He's got integrity. He's one of us. He's a wrestling fan. He mocked jazz hands on national television. What more do you want from one human being? And he's got a, a bunch of lovely looking children, and especially Rebecca. I don't know how mo many more he's got. I may have just added him some. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, you never know. Steven's a good looking guy. What? But in all seriousness, <laughs> did just 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 drop drop whatever you're doing now. If you're mad at somebody and they've broken the law or have harmed you in some kind of way, they can be brought to legal justice. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, the number to call. I it, it, as a matter of fact, I wish, I wish that Stephen had taken the case and represented. Rand Paul's neighbor, good old Renee down there in Bowling Green, when he tackled that piece of shit, knocked his fucking wig off, gave him a hernia and broke his fucking ribs because he's a piece of shit. Uh, and uh, his, it, you heard about this, right? This is a couple years back now. I didn't know the wig got knocked off, but I heard about the rest of it. Well, you know it had to. If he hit him hard enough to break his ribs, gave him a hernia, you know the wig went south. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and, and of course, Rand Paul sued him. I, if, if Stephen P. knew... Had had represented Renee, we'd we'd be in a different world right now because that fucking criminal Rand Paul would have been in fucking jail for something. So eight 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 six nine two eight zero eight four, newlawoffice dot com. If 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 your neighbor is a Republican and you tackle him and break his ribs, and give him a hernia. I bet you Stephen P. New can get you off. Well, just don't have any witnesses. We can talk about Stephen getting guys off later on. Well, let's get some questions here, Jim. Oh, would you get your mind out of the gutter? Oh, please. You just gave him 40 kids. I didn't give him 40 kids. He's a good-looking guy. He has a bunch of kids out there somewhere. <laughs> well, I didn't say 40. You didn't say 40. <clears throat> Asked questions, Brian. Okay, well, we've got a bunch of questions. Let's get some AEW ones out of the way here. Oh, God. All right. Yeah, get it out of the way. Ain't that sick enough? All these, right. These may be good questions, and not everything in AEW is bad, so you may actually... Yes. Not only have some insight, but enjoy the questions here. This first one was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Mike DeGeorge. How, when, and with who would you eventually book Chris Jericho to lose the AEW title? It's too early to do so now, but I would want to have a plan in place to build to it. And on this topic, we have had people ask, do you think 
it's too early to do a change if they did it from Jericho to Moxley. So what are your thoughts on Jericho, the AEW championship and long-term booking for him as the champion? Well, it's, it, yes, it's definitely too early for him to lose and, and it needs to be Cody when it happens. Um, and I can't imagine that their plan overall is not to see, here's the thing when you can't, I've started promotions from scratch, right? You can't just come in with your top guy and your next top guy already there unless you keep them apart for some fucking reason for so long, which is why they did the thing they did. Everybody's going, well, what did Cody can never challenge for the title again? Yeah. Terry Funk had to retire in 1983 too. This whole thing has to be a way to keep Cody and Jericho apart for a year or whatever the long length of time is. And then Jericho finally does something so heinous or something happens that the fan demand would be more for Cody getting his hands on him than honoring the stipulation. And that's when the match happens and Cody beats him for the title. No, you can't put it on anybody else now, Moxley or anybody else. It's ridiculous. Jericho's carrying a fucking program. And to establish it as a serious championship, uh, he needs to have it for a while because you know, Shitstein uh, wasn't the one who started the trend, but he certainly exacerbated it of just switching belts back and forth where it meant nothing. He said they were just props. The only way you have a champion that's taken seriously that means anything is if he hangs on to it for a long period of time, which is why every major world champion in the history of professional wrestling up until the 90s had lengthy reigns. Um, I'm not talking about regional champions where you ran every fucking week, right? <laughs> you could play with that because that was a horse of a different color, but the man had to be the man for a couple years or three years or four years, Bruno, eight years, whatever the fuck, Fez. So, yeah, you know, they got to they gotta keep it busy. They got to keep Jericho busy and they got to keep Cody busy. And they definitely need to bring in some new talent before then uh, for that to happen because once... Jericho's finished with Moxley. Who else has he got that anybody would take seriously? Once that fucking Moxley's finished with Jericho, he then you know then he once can, Cody's finished with MJF. What do they do? Well, that's the problem. They need to hopefully think that some of these contracts are coming up or whoever the whatever they've got in their back pocket because nobody else would be taken seriously from a name standpoint or from a fucking uh from a standpoint of the way they've gotten over anybody that's new on television that hasn't been seen in other promotions on mainstream television in the United States none of these guys no what the fuck can you even see anybody on the horizon so they got to keep this thing going for a while but they're going to need some new names a couple of questions coming out of this one what do you do if let's i don't know that he does or doesn't but if chris jericho has any plans to do any concerts or do a mini tour at any point during his title reign? What do you do? Well, you don't hurt him because he's a heel. Um, is suspending. See, here's the problem. You could suspend him. You know, guys, you get suspended and they'd go to Japan or whatever the fuck. Or, but it's all out there. People would know he was touring. And anything that you do... And then he goes on tour with Fozzie and people go, okay, they did that because he's going on tour with Fozzie. It's like a JYD being blinded, but yet being on a fucking game show on the other channel and he can see it, it, it wouldn't have worked. You got to fucking stay home or go, be somewhere else. And now with the internet, there's no way to be anywhere else that anybody doesn't know about it. So the, all these things, they, and that's the worst thing about their audience their audience, the AEW audience, is on the internet more than anybody in life, right? I mean, we've seen that because they most of them have no life. If they're watching these fucking YouTube shows and these fucking being the elites and the, just every goddamn minute thing these people put out, um, they know before anybody else what the fuck is bullshit or not. And they know where everybody is and they know what's going on, so it's almost impossible to do anything with these people because they know everything already. So they've painted themselves in a lot of corners. And then with Moxley and Jericho, which I think has been built up pretty nicely, what do you do? They're about to have their 
title match on the pay-per-view at the end of this month. Potentially, you could draw it out and make it a multi-match program, but if Moxley's not going to win the title, how do you get him out of that without taking away all the progress that's been made in developing his character there? Well, you can take him off a, a branch the other way. Let's if, if Jericho obviously wins the first match, but if it's a just a raw fuck. He's just Moxley's cheated. And then they have a, a rematch and you can play with the finish there. And then, you know, if they get three out of it, then you have uh, the same thing as, <clears throat> for example, when, when uh, uh, Bad Blood, Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker inside the Hell in a Cell for the WWF title. But Vince didn't want to switch it. So how does Undertaker lose and still not come back and get his ultimate revenge because you introduce Kane and send him off in another direction to where it's the Undertaker's choice not to continue to pursue Shawn Michaels and the WWF title because there's more pressing pertinent business in his life. And that's a graceful exit, as we used to say. He's got a way out, was the term. Give him a way out. Um, but who's important enough to do that? And it not be a step down for, for Moxley? I don't know. Because the stars they have are the stars they started with, and everybody else on the program is basically in the same place or worse off than they were. Well, like Pac, for example. Does he ever win anything? We'll, um, we'll, I, we'll you know, address that in our next question, actually. <laughs> well, okay, but I'm just saying the thing is, I I think as much as I've seen him on TV, I think he's he's got beat, so they've lost that opportunity to make him and you know and then he's standing there as we mentioned on his last week's program with the scared schoolgirl next to him not restrained so she was just paralyzed by the frightening countenance that he had on and couldn't move and her feet turned to jelly or whatever but no they could have taken that guy and instead of putting him in a bunch of main event dream matches for their fucking fans that like to jack off over same because they're not sure what fucking female genitalia looks like they could have just taken this guy and brought in somebody every week for him to beat in five fucking minutes on television. Beat and promo, beat and promo. I want you, you motherfucker. I want to be the champion. Look what I'm doing. And everybody beats in five minutes, then you don't see them again for a while because you can pick any ungoddamn signed talent in the world to get beat in five minutes. But every week he's out there because the. Pardon me for not knowing, but has he been on national television before? Pac? Yes. Oh, yeah. He was in NXT, and then he went to the WWE, and he was there. Uh, he was in the light heavyweight division, oh, I believe, oh, but he was there for a he while. He was a light heavyweight? Yeah. Cruiser. Boy, he, I forget what it is there. Yeah. He's been, he's been uh, as 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 my mother used to say, you need to eat a whole lot more of Van Camp's pork and beans to be tough enough to mess with me. He's been on the pork and beans because he looks like a fucking beast. Oh, he's been on the Jeff Van Camp diet. Yeah. There you go. Van Camp, Jeff Van Camp's pork and beans anyway. Well, NXT wasn't on television then, so it doesn't count. If he was a cruiserweight, it doesn't count. Hopefully people have forgotten that. I assume it was under another name. So It was, yeah. Okay, good. So take this fucking guy from the start, and you've got five minutes that you don't devote to Japanese schoolgirls. Neville, by the way. It was Adrian Neville. Neville. Oh, Adrian and then he got Neville. to the main roster, and Vince hates first name, so he just became Neville without the Adrian. Okay, Neville. Well, boy, I would really fucking be scared of a guy named Neville. But as I, as that <laughs> badass fucker looks at me, and I'm and he's called Pac, and he's fucking staring at me, and he's cutting that promo, he's a scary fucker. So I would, every week... Leave off a Japanese schoolgirl. I know, you know, their paper routes are not as lucrative as they used to be, so they need to make some extra money, but leave off a Japanese schoolgirl and put Pack in the ring against somebody so he can beat the fuck out of him for four or five minutes and beat him with his finish and then announce to the world he's not going to stop until he gets the world championship and do that for your first three months of television and then, then get him in an angle. But they've already had him in main events like he was somebody to begin with. Like they assume everybody that is on their television was somebody to begin with, even though they hadn't been on television before or hadn't been on television under that name or hadn't been on television and featured. Then you fucking start doing shit with him. Then you got another fucking star. But right now, the only stars they got are the ones they started with. They think Olivier's a star. He's not a star. You even see the fucking some of the all elite wrestling fans on Twitter 
like Mitt Romney that have a conscience of, of some description saying, well, yeah, we like all elite wrestling, but Omega's been booked like a twat. Um, so, and that's his doing, by the way. Well, yeah, that's what makes it even worse. Yeah. He's, he's, he's so charitable and kind to put all these other underneath wrestlers over to make them stars. And in actuality, that the flaw in the logic is he wasn't a star to begin with because nobody knows who the fuck he is besides the same people who are going to watch his shit anyway. Go to the mall and say, okay, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Nature Boy, Ric Flair, Kenny Omega. Let me know what fucking response you get. So anyway, yes, if they'd have started making stars, they'd be well off now. But what they're fucking, how many months are they into this? November, December, January. They're four months into this, and they're in the same place they were, except, you know, the, the guys that they thought were the best wrestlers in the world look worse than they have because they never win convincingly, decisively against anybody. So that's what I'd do. All right. Well, on a similar topic, our next question was sent into corny drive through at gmail.com from Carlos in Jacksonville. Jim, what are your thoughts? Wait a minute. Is that just an alias for Charlie in Starkville? I don't think Charlie has any reason to use an alias and we'll have a couple of questions from him. I'm sure later on and it'll be, under I'm his sure we will. Yeah. What are your thoughts on AEW's statistics and rankings? <sighs> and also what are your thoughts on the statistics resetting? for 2020 i guess for a new year would be yeah for a new year well that's one way to get them out of the fucking horrible position they painted themselves into uh but <sighs> tony Khan's the statistics guy and, and talking and and even the 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 description and of the show that's on my cable system right a new wrestling league that incorporates analytics and sporting statistics in or statistics what? into the sport. Yes. I swear to God. <laughs> I did not see that. <laughs> That's not word for word, but you know, if I ask Travis Bickle, he live. he, he's probably got spectrum cable, but it's it, on the guide. It's a new league. It's either that sometimes they say a new league featuring Kenny Omega and the young bucks, well, whoopee, or a new league that introduces analytics and statistics to the sport. Like, this would be a new thing to have win and losses and shit, you know, because that's all they got to go on, but that's what they sold us. So I'm not knocking all elite wrestling. When I say that you sold us a sports-based presentation and that involves two guys that are supposed to hate each other, you know, obviously cooperating and shit to allow each other to hit the other one. Like we talked about on a program yesterday or Tony Khan's a statistics and analytics guy. And this was his idea and he thought it would work and they humored him. And, you know, I mean, the smart ones, uh, most of the guys, Jericho, Cody, the smart guys know that this is fucking ridiculous, but they gave the the owner son. I gave Rick Rubin a mummy, right? <clears throat> so they go, okay, well, we'll do this, Tony, because they figure we ain't going to die on this hill. But what it does is it points out the fact that nobody knows how to book a star because I would bet you, I don't know if the records are accessible on the internet, but I would bet you that Jericho and Moxley and Cody are the only ones that are above 50, 50, 500%, right? Now the new year they can start and they can try to do it right or better. But if everybody has a record, then you are telling the people flat out statistically that most of your roster is a bunch of losers. Because the only way to make stars is to have them undefeated or nearly undefeated or undefeated, but with a, a one gripe or one fluke or whatever. That's the way you make star. So that means that a lot of these guys are going to be losing more than they win. And it doesn't slap you in the face every time a guy comes out, if he looks good and he can perform that he is less than, than 500% for his win loss record. But if you show them that it does kind of slap you in the face. So that's why Goldberg got over but until they fucked with the record and people could figure it out because he was winning more matches in a week than he could possibly have, right, in days in the week. But when he had a legitimate undefeated streak, the unbeaten streak always gets somebody over. And as you don't do it very often because of that, if you did, then it wouldn't get anybody over. But Goldberg got over, even though he uh, he could do three fucking moves and he looked like a beast. He was a horrible fucking wrestler because he was a rookie. But he looked like a beast and he could do three convincing moves and that's what he did. And they smashed him over. 
Magnum TA in, in when he first came to Crockett. The first year, year and a half, every time he wrestled on television, what did he do? He won with the belly-to-belly -belly suplex in under 90 seconds. And Magnum, we had just worked with him in mid in mid South before he went to Crockett. And Dusty anointed him with the, the Barry Windham spot. Magnum was green, and he'd primarily been in tag team matches. But being able to go out there in singles matches on the house shows, the untelevised shows, every night and work with Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard and Ric Flair and blah, 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 he got good real quick. But when he first went to Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, you couldn't put him on television against just a job guy or against really anybody for 10 minutes without exposing him. And you didn't want that. So Dusty was smart. I'm sure Cody obviously knows this. Every time you saw him on TV until he got in the upper mix and he was ready to carry the ball, belly to belly, 90 seconds or less, undefeated. And that's the only thing people saw besides their house show matches. And then you could fucking give him some more time. So anyway, records matter when the guy is winning. When <laughs> Rick Flair, can you imagine what he, or the Midnight Express when we were champions? We hardly ever won when we were the world tag team champions because Dusty, Dusty created a world where we could lose at any minute, which is what the people wanted to see. So once we fucked the baby face in a high profile situation and got the belts, every team we worked with, we might fuck them once except for the road warriors. We never fucked them at all, but we still drew a million dollars with them in one night. The midnight would get disqualified to keep the title or they'd get beaten in non-title matches. And then we'd go back on TV and we'd win convincingly and we'd talk our heat back. That's the way wrestling works. If they had said, when here comes the midnight express, the world tag team champions, they lost all seven matches they had last week. What the fuck? You fucking morons. So so that's that's the problem. You can create stars with an undefeated or nearly unblemished record, but to do that, if you're telling everybody what the record is of everybody on your roster, most of your roster looks like a bunch of fucking losers. And they, if somebody had bothered to tell Tony Khan that, well, I say if somebody had bothered, he wouldn't listen. He never listened to anything else. I told him on the phone either, so why would he have listened to that? But that's what happens. And I wish somebody would prove, show some statistics to prove me wrong about what I just said about statistics. Well, I just pulled up actually on the AEW website. They have it on their website. They have the rankings for men's, women's, and tag team. Let's do okay, wait, wait, don't say anything. Chris Jericho, he got beat once, didn't he? Somewhere in a, was it a six man or some kind of it must have Something. been, a, it was either a six, I mean, yeah, because I guess when Marco Stunt counted the pin, that wouldn't have counted. It must have been like a tag team or a six man, yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing it, and pardon me for not living my life around AEW wrestling ratings, but he got beat once in, in a gimmick, in a six man. Okay, that's permissible. In the old days in St. Louis, Every couple of years, they'd have the world champion get beat in a tag team match, and the guy that pinned him would instantly become a contender for the world title. That's a smart use. Otherwise, I would assume Jericho is undefeated. Am I correct? Well, let me first say that it doesn't specify here any of the wins or losses being from tag team matches. I assume some of these are, but it doesn't say that anywhere here. Well, I think they've, they've got an overall thing because on their statistics on the screen, they give the guys record, but they have an overall. So even, even though, and here's that, that's another thing. I just thought of that, even though they restarted the record in 2020 to try to, you know, get somebody over, they're still showing the overall, which includes last year where they didn't know what the fuck they were doing at all. So but there's two. There's a there's a this year's record and there's an overall, right? So Chris Jericho's 2020 singles record is zero and zero, but his overall is ten one and one. Okay, ten wins, one loss, one one draw. He went to the time limit. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. The world champion has, is undefeated except for the one fucking fluky pinfall that the title wasn't on the line and he went to a time limit draw. There you go. Now, I would have to think, well, either Cody or Moxley is next because they don't have any other stars. The number one contender for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship is John Moxley 
with a 2020 singles record of three wins, no losses, and okay. an overall record of eight, one, and one. Okay, there you go. John Moxley is a star. He did the one job to who did, who did he do the job to? You know, I don't even remember. Who did he do it a job was, to? Oh, God damn it. When they, who won the match where him and Olivier fell off the roof? Well, anyway, were, were there any winners in that match? <laughs> no, they're, they're especially not the fans. No, there were no winners there. Uh, but he, okay, eight, one, and one. John Moxley's a star. Cody hasn't done that many jobs, but I, it's it's been a couple, right? What's Cody? Cody is actually the number two ranked contender. Twenty twenty singles record two and zero. Oh, overall nine three and one. Okay, that's. <sighs> That's a couple more losses probably than at this stage of the game, but he know we know he lost and can't challenge for the title again. And there was a couple of whatever the fuck they made a couple of mistakes, but now past that, does Olivier ever beat anybody? Well, let me go through the rest of the top five. It's not a top 10. It's a top five. Okay. Wait, we're not even, we're not even to Olivier yet. Oh no. Cause the number three ranked contender for the AEW world championship is pack. His 2020, okay, okay. 2020 singles record, one and one. Overall, six, five and one. Six, five. So he's 50 50, basically. The number three contender. He has lost or drawn as many times as he's won in the whole company. Okay. The number four ranked contender is Kenny Olivier, a 2020 singles record of zero and zero. So no singles matches. And an overall record of 13 and 5. Uh, well, there you go. And okay. Uh, past that, uh, as far as a singles, who else? No MJF, obviously. No Darby Allen. Well, because no. MJF never gets to wrestle. The number five contender, and I like this guy, but when you see the record here, it's like, how is this number five? Sammy Guevara, his, oh. tw- his 2020 singles record, 2 and 1. His overall record, six and seven. So he's below 500. Well, there you go. And everybody else in contention for the singles championship, by inference, is worse than that. Any guesses on, (laughs) I got to do this, the women's division. Oh, good Lord. Obviously, Riho is the champion. She is 2-0 in 2020 and an overall record of 10-2. and two. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The 98-pound schoolgirl is 10, and she's got, a, she's got a better record than anybody else besides Jericho on the other side. The number one ranked contender is Nyla Rose. 2020, uh, 2020 that's right. That is the year. 2-1. and one. What do you think her overall record is? I don't remember her winning on television. Six wins, four losses. <sighs> okay, no- and, and also, and now this includes their YouTube show and uh, their pay-per-views. They don't run house shows. No, it, I think this would include any matches under the AEW band. Yes. Yes. But I, I'd love to see this, and maybe some in, in, intrepid cult of cornet member can do this i'd love to see this the statistics for television because youtube don't make a fuck because any anybody they have a national television show on tnt so the best foot forward ought to be there if these people are winning on youtube but losing on national television then it doesn't matter we should see statistics for just the tv show but go ahead so the number two ranked female competitor who couldn't who well, couldn't number one number one or number oh, but number two but number one ranked to the champion who couldn't throw the 98 pound champion through a fucking table last week is barely above 500 uh six and four okay very good with the same overall record but a one and one 2020 singles record the number two ranked contender currently is hikaru shida oh lovely the number three contender and whatever happened to her, she hasn't been on TV in a while. With a zero and one singles record in 2020 and an overall <laughs> four and three record is Chris Statlander. Well, she must have gone back to the planet Zambodia. <laughs> the number four contender. I heard, I heard Ray, Ray Walston finally got his ship fixed. She went back to Mars. See, that's for the elderly folks in the group. 
Yes, the people who enjoyed the Robert Conrad 20-minute segment at the top yeah. of the show. Yeah, well, hey, I was making a point. The number four ranked contender with a one and one record in 2020, <laughs> and overall eight and five, that's actually better than I thought it was going to be, is Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. Uh, eight and five. Uh-huh. And the number five contender, I actually don't even remember seeing her in an actual match. I guess she had him. With a 2020 singles record of 1-0, and and I don't know if she's still there even, overall 3-1 and one is Awesome Kong. I think, didn't they just finish her up? That's what Because she's going thought. to do something else. But okay, so the, the girl they just finished up is undefeated this year and has a better record than anybody except the champion, but she just finished up. Okay, well, that makes sense. And then I don't even know if we're going to do the tag teams just because it doesn't actually give you... It gives you everyone's tag team record for 2020 as a unit, but it doesn't give you, like, for the overall, like, for Omega and the Hangman, who are the champions, they have different overall. Omega 13 and 5, Hangman Adam Page 9 yeah. and 7. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Page, that, well, that's singles, tags, that's everything, but Page is, they're telling everybody here, a- Hangman Adam Page, another guy we could be pushing, and I just realized he wasn't in the top five on the singles. Sammy Guevara is, but a- Hangman Adam Page is, Hangman Adam Page is nine and seven. Nine and seven. Well, there you go. And he's a drunk, and he's unreliable. <laughs> so... Boy, there's a fucking star for you. And, I'm, and I like Adam Page. I wish that another company had been pushing him so he'd be a star by now. Hangman Adam Page is an unreliable drunk and has a record of nine and seven. Boy, there's a way to make a fucking star. All right, what are these other tag team guys' individual records? Is this just the home for misfit toys where you put guys in a tag team because they never win? But I guess the point is it shows Omega and Hangman 3-0 and in 2020 as a tag team, but it doesn't give overall as a team for the past like scu former champions frankie kazarian 13 and 4 scorpio sky 14 and 5 2020 tag team record one and one it has nothing of what they did in 2019 as a tag team i think you would need that stat well i mean this is it's all meaningless anyway but as far as whether a guy is on the winning end or the losing end more is what i'm interested in and just in terms of how they've been booked what about, well, okay, what about the Young Fucks? The Young Bucks, 2020 tag team record, one and one. Overall, Matt Jackson and Nick Jackson both have 11 wins. Matt Jackson, six losses. Nick Jackson, seven losses. Remember, he had that singles match with Phoenix, I think. Yeah, yeah. And Felix kicked his ass. And then um, Santana and Ortiz, the number three ranked contenders. They have an 0 and 1 record in 2020, and they are both overall seven and four. Well, that's better actually than being eleven and seven or whatever uh, to me. So, uh, but uh, okay. The number four ranked contenders in the tag team division are the Dark Order, Evil Uno, <laughs> and Stu Grayson. Both have a five and two record. You, so you're telling me that the the overall the best record percentage wise. Well, maybe it, it, SCU was around there somewhere, but the best record percentage-wise is the job order. Uh, they've only done two jobs. They've only done two jobs, yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I hadn't thought of that, yeah. And then closing out the top five tag team rankings, I guess I'm now seeing why it's not a top ten. The best friends! <laughs> with an overall, well, not an overall, but a 2020 tag team record of one and one. And then Trent... Formerly having a last name, but now just the, Trent. The, the talented member of He's the group. He's good. He is talented. Yeah. Overall, 7 and 11. Oh, God. And Chuck Taylor, overall, 6 and 8. Uh, the 6 had to be forfeits because Chuck Taylor couldn't whip cream <laughs> with an outboard motor. But when I see that, anybody that wants to could just look right up and see why none of these people are stars. Good. Good for them. But yeah, that's all the things that's wrong with doing that for everybody because you can't do that for everybody. You do that for your winners. You talk about the champion being undefeated. You talk about the guy you're pushing being undefeated or on a win streak or whatever. You don't give everybody's record because then most of your roster looks like a bunch of fucking dicks. And that's what most of their roster looks like 
whether they can work or not because of the way they're presented, because they're assuming that everybody's over from the start and only with the fucking obsessive minded people that have been following these fucking pricks since the start are these people already over as far as goddamn the, um, a, a national audience. So sorry. Okay, well, our next question, Jim, sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com was sent by John in Walkertown, excuse me, Walkertown, North Carolina. I can't speak. There's anger in my teeth. Why does Vince McMahon... <laughs> You've got angry teeth? I've got angry teeth today. Why does Vince McMahon enjoy changing the names of all of his wrestlers? Recently, Buddy Murphy had his first name dropped and is now known as Murphy. Oh, God. Bobby Roode was changed to Robert Roode. Chad Gable was changed to Shorty G, which is maybe the worst of them all. Yeah. I get the change for copyright reasons, but why change the name if WWE holds the copyright for the original? Well, and if Robert Roode was Robert Roode because he was more distinct. Like, a, you know... It, Robert Roode, like when Terry Taylor switched heel in WCW and he became Terrence Taylor, you know, it's just a more lofty, snooty type of fucking presentation. And and, and Bobby Roode is an incredible talent. And I've always been a fan of his, I don't, whatever they call him, as long as they push him, right? He's fucking insanely good. I, as a matter of fact, I always thought that he was the second coming of Arn Anderson. Always knows where he is in the ring, never makes a mistake, incredible body language. Even when he's confused because somebody's doing some crazy shit around him, you can't tell he's lost. He just, he's incredible. Uh, so whatever, you know, <clears throat> they can do to accentuate his presentation, great. But the other ones, yeah, they're just burying those guys. I don't know why. I don't, have, somebody having one name, yes, it works for Cher. It works for Liberace, whatever the fuck. It doesn't work for Murphy. Murphy? And and Shorty G is just, I guess he pissed somebody off and they just wrote him off. And as I recall, he's a pretty good young talent. Very good. Yeah. Um, But, you know, nobody, it's like, it's like the Republicans, boy, Trump and Vince are so similar. It's like the Republicans just lying straight out of their ass like they do every time they go out in public and expecting people not to to see it and to say, what the fuck? They, they just. Oh, this will be better. And they know it's not going to be better. They know they're assing off with some guy or they're fucking with some guy. Shorty G is not better than Chad Gable. They know that. And they know everybody's going to laugh at him. That's what they're going for, for whatever fucking reason, because they maybe he's too good of an athlete, but he's not entertaining enough. So the writers don't like him or whatever the fuck. But and and somebody. I don't even know that Vince knows about these things anymore because used to he would have. But now he's so far above everything. Um, I think they just, they just do it because some fucking twerp that's never been in a goddamn men's locker room before has become a wrestling writer and decides that it might be funny, you know, which is why they all ought to be fucking run through a razor blade factory and then dipped in a goddamn gallon of alcohol. But that's just my opinion about the wrestling writers. Okay. Well, we're talking about Vince here and his propensity for. Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't even know if Vince knows that Short, Shorty Gable or Chad but, Gable became became Shorty G. But beyond that, the whole getting rid of... I don't think he cares. Who like, gives a shit? Like Cesaro was originally, what, Antonio Cesaro? Rusev was Alexander Rusev. And all of a sudden, he gets some kind of hitch where he's like, you know what? They can't have a first name. It's not marketable. Well, and, and in that case, yeah. You know, with those guys, he I don't know. I can't explain it to you. It's just these fucking... You know, when Vince wakes up and decides, okay, all the plan that these two big hot shot executives have set up, I don't like, we're going to do it differently. You're fired. And he just does that sometimes. He gets, you should have seen me look at him like he had a steaming turd hanging out of his mouth. When I was there the first time he said, don't call it a hospital, call it a medical facility. He said, it sounds fake. If say hospital, it's like old wrestling stuff. I said, Vince. <laughs> Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, my God, I'm hurt. Take me to the medical facility. And he just looked at me like I was an idiot because I was telling the truth. Medical facility, pal. It's, it's, not, it's not insulting their intelligence by saying they're being hospitalized. What the fuck? Okay, it's insulting their intelligence by making up a medical facility to take them to for their phony injury. <laughs> yeah, fuck. It, can, you, can you tell why I couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there? 
a pretty good understanding. Let's get out of this question. Let's get another one here. This one was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from John Fell in Baltimore. John returns. And he's fallen once again. But at least he's had time to heal up. I, I assume so. You've been getting a lot of questions on modern wrestling, so I wanted to go back a little in time. Thank you, John. I was wondering if you have any stories about Ben and Mike Sharp and or Mr. <laughs> wrestling one and two when they were tag team partners. Thanks guys. And coming soon, the Charlie from Starkville and John fell in Baltimore submitted questions. Omnibus. <laughs> well, first I was, thank you, John. I was, I'm not as old as Robert Conrad. I was not around when Mike and Ben Sharp were tag teaming. Um, they were a top team in the 50s. Matter of fact, they pioneered Japanese wrestling. They were huge in L.A. and out in Hawaii. Um, uh, Iron, obviously, Mike Sharp, that the people remember from the 80s WWF, was the son of the original Mike Sharp and his brother Ben. Um, you know, they were huge. They were like six foot six when nobody was six six back in those days, and 250 or 60 or 70 pounds. So they were like fucking giants. That's why what got them over so good in Japan. Here's these fucking evil American giants. The same people had bombed us 10 years ago and Ricky Dozan's going to kick the shit out of them. That's what started pro wrestling in, in Japan. Um, so, you know, but I, I've never obviously got to see them first time around. I've read history on them and et cetera. I have some valuable programs from San Francisco and places of the time. Uh, but, but my personal connection is that's what Mike Tanay and I used to call ourselves. Because even though he was from California and I was from Kentucky, we had so many of the same opinions, so many of the same wrestlers, so many we would say so many of the same things. That was what made TNA bearable after getting out of a Russo-inspired production meeting, which was like coming down from a hallucinogenic-inspired bad trip. Me and Mike Tanay and Don West and one or two of the other guys on a rotating basis would sit in the production room while everybody else went out and jacked off somewhere and didn't get any work done and we would actually talk about wrestling and so mike and i because mike was like are you sure your dad didn't spend any time in california i said well, what about yours coming to kentucky so we were mike and ben sharp the sharp brothers but as far as mr wrestling one and two uh not only did we work with two uh, on in the closing days of his career in mid-south when he was you know partners with magnum ta uh, but obviously wrestling one and two in the late sixties, early seventies were two of the top baby faces in the business. And the reason why that actually Tim Woods came to, to one of our Smoky Mountain shows we did in Charlotte, the Carolina memories event and got a plaque and an award and everything. Uh, he was an NCAA champion and then became the masked scientific. He was the American El Santo in the white mask and the white tights and, you know, uh, the the technical wrestler, but because he was just a normal looking guy, they juiced him up a little bit with the mask and everything. And then once he got over, then in some territories, he'd take the mask off. That's why sometimes he was billed as Mr. Wrestling Tim Woods. If he came up uh, the ranks and got an NWA World Heavyweight title shot, um, but a masked man couldn't hold the title because you had to reveal your identity to be champion – then he'd say, I'm going to take the mask off in the ring before my title match in the Omni, and that would fucking sell tickets. Be, oh, shit, he's going to take it off. And the only reason that it was Jerry Jarrett that created Wrestling 2, because they couldn't, when he took the book, uh, you know, Jim Barnett gave him the book in, in Georgia, he said he couldn't get Mr. Wrestling 1, Tim Woods, to come back. He was either in Florida or the Carolinas or wherever he was, so he said, we'll, we'll create another Mr. Wrestling. And 2 ended up in Georgia pretty much getting over better than Tim Woods had because he had so much fire on his promos and his body language when he was younger and that fucking million dollar knee lift. So then they put them together as a super team and they would, you know, win or place highly in the Thanksgiving tag team tournaments and everything. But they were, you know, they were a great tag team. And then both of them were, were stars individually, but Johnny Walker had been working, uh, here in, in the Tennessee territory when Jarrett first opened up Louisville and he was in some of the early main events here and Jarrett liked him. He'd worked the territory and what they did as I recall to keep the people from knowing who it was. Cause Johnny Walker had, I don't think he'd, 
I'm not sure whether he'd been in Georgia uh, that often uh, or that recently before the Wrestling 2 run or not, but they put in the magazines that Professor Tanaka had broken Johnny Walker's neck and he had to retire. And do you remember seeing the picture in the old magazines of Johnny Walker in the hospital bed in traction with his neck in the fucking gimmick, right? So, okay, Johnny Walker is retired. He's no longer a professional wrestler. He's been injured and his career is over. When Wrestling 2 came around, I mean, I'm sure the longtime fans and a few of the smart people around know it, but knew it for, for the most part. Nobody knew. And he didn't do any of his rubber man shit. He didn't, he still had the fired up body language, but he didn't do the shit where he would fucking twist because he was getting older by the time anyway, where he would twist himself up into fucking pretzels and everything. He left the rubber man shit and focused on building wrestling two shit. And you know what? It worked. So he was more over as wrestling two than he ever was as Johnny rubber man Walker. But yeah, that, uh, that more contemporarily and I, boy, and he's one of the guys that I learned to fucking how to whip somebody from because they, they put me in, in the whipping stipulation where Magnum and two lost and they each had to take five lashes from me in the midnight express. Right. And goddamn, I'd never whipped anybody before and they didn't tell me anything. So I didn't double the fucking belt up and I whipped him across the back and it wrapped around and caught him up under the chin. And he looked around and he said, after number five, you better get the fuck out of this ring. And I did. If you go back and watch any of the tapes from that from that series, every time I swung the last fucking lash, I was already letting go of that fucking belt and headed toward the fucking ropes. So by the time he took it, I was gone because he would have fucking ripped me in half that night. And I just made sure that he never got a chance to fucking give me a receipt. Um, Has anyone but- other than Jerry Jarrett confirmed the story that he created Mr. Wrestling 2? You know, I don't know, because but he always told it. I, I know he's told it, but I believe Bill Watts was actually booking already in Georgia when Mr. Wrestling 2 showed up. Do you think? I'm looking at results right here because that's what I had thought, and I looked it up here. So the Georgia War, you know, breaks down the end of November. Jerry right. comes in for the first sh- few shows. That's when Eddie Graham comes up. Well, now, Jerry Jarrett didn't take the book when it first happened, he no. was just part of the crew from Tennessee that brought guys down Bearcat Brown and Jerry Lawler and Don Green. That's right. And et cetera, because they were filling out the cards. He took over as Booker at the end of 73 once Jim Barnett purchased the company. Right. Bill Watts took over as the Booker in early 73. Uh, and, you know, we can, I'm not going to go into all the inner dynamics there, but Bill Watts was put there. Eddie Graham had an interest. A lot of people had an interest. Bill Watts was made the Booker. The first show I have for Mr. Wrestling 2 showing up, let's see, would be, I have Mr. Wrestling 2 in January of 73, the end of of January 73. So I don't know for sure, but Jerry Jarrett wasn't booking in the beginning of 1973 or throughout 1973 until the end of the year. And then you could tell when he took over as the book, because all of a sudden the Garvins are in there, Jerry Lawler's in there. Yeah, but this is Bill Watts booking here with Leo Garibaldi as his booking assistant. Well, not by his choice. Yeah, then maybe because you needed a stooge somewhere. Um, Maybe then he is remembering fondly that he pushed wrestling to like he started him, but he was already there and he just pushed him to the moon because we know he pushed him to the moon. Yes. Very interesting. Very interesting. But he liked Johnny Walker anyway because he had worked here. We know that much. Yes. Can't deny that. Yes. All right. Well, our next question, Jim, was sent in via email to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Matthew in New York City. Hey there. (laughs) (laughs) Every time. Hi, Hi, big boy. Anything that begins either a song or a letter with hey there, you laugh every time. (laughs) hey there famous young actor timothy chalamet (laughs) famous young actor timothy chalamet from call me by your name and interstellar and little women etc what the fuck once ran into jim at a burger joint in manhattan about 10 years or so ago 
I think Mr. Cornette was in Ring of Honor at the time. He probably would have been. Well, I was about to say, yeah, that would have been because the only place that we ever ate when I went to New York for Ring of Honor was that burger, B-R-G-R place, because it was the only place you could actually get normal food, and it looked like it was clean, and it wasn't $100. Timothy Chalamet was not famous at the time, a young high school wrestling fan, and found Jim was in Manhattan at the burger joint via a tweet. Does Jim recall this meeting at all? And does Jim even know who Timothy Chalamet, famous actor, is? What was the burger joint, and was it any good? And what's the best post-wrestling card restaurant meal Jim ever had in Manhattan? What was the card, and what was the meal? What the fuck? All right, well, first of all, (laughs) no, I'm sorry. I didn't know who this guy was because he wasn't anybody yet. I don't know who he is now because I haven't seen those movies, but if he's a fan, I appreciate him. Um, and yes, I remember I don't I remember meeting fans in a variety of places in New York. So I can't remember that specific time. Like I said, it probably was, and Stace was tweeting uh at that time because I think she just got her fucking smartphone or whatever. So she every time we would go somewhere, she'd tweet a picture of it. Um you remember I, I said we went because you and I we went to the fucking place with the sliders out there in the village or wherever. <clears throat> That's basically you know because I hate the New York pizza. Um, I hate fucking all those street corner fucking places that look like they're got it's just the filth in New York. What do you mean you hate New York pizza? What the fuck? the the places that just these these little storefront fucking places that looks like they haven't been cleaned in fucking three years and ought to be on the fucking kitchen nightmares and. And New York pizza, most, I mean, if you go in a goddamn nice restaurant, yes, you're going to get good food, but most of these New York pizza fucking stands, to me, they're goddamn handing you a fucking roofing shingle. I'd much rather have Emo's Pizza in St. Louis with that Provel cheese, oh my God, or the Rock Bar in Evansville, or a, a, a Bear Nose here in Louisville, or a, a Evansville. Mighty Meaty Wick. Huh? I don't want New York City pizza. I want pizza from Evansville. Get out it's of not here. New, it's you- not New York style pizza. It's actually St. Louis style pizza. Emo's Pizza is my favorite pizza. Every time I get anywhere near St. Louis, I make sure I'm my hotel is near an Emo's. Um, but anyway, um, most of the food is either overpriced or come in New York downtown comes from a place where you worry about fucking sanitation. Now, the place we went for the sliders, that was fucking great, right? You took us over there. Um there's a joint, like I said, called Burger. I think it's B R G R in in Manhattan. You remember? Did we ever go there after a show or whatever? I'm not sure. We went to various I think different I, places. So well, remember. that's and also we went uh, with the, this last run with Ring of Honor. I went a lot with uh, Dan Bynum and Mark Davis. We went there when we were at you know at, at the Hammerstein or whatever. I remember. Um, <laughs> I hadn't thought of there's an, and down in Little Italy that Angelo's I really enjoyed, and there was another place uh, that had great cheap martinis, and they went out of business. One time we were hanging out in the village. It was me, my then girlfriend, you, and Stacy, and we were having a good time. I may have had a few cocktails, and all of a sudden, I think Stacy went next door to get a tattoo. And you went over there to like walk her in and then you were coming back. I remember that. I remember that. Well, you came back with your arm around some guy. Uh, Not not that there's anything wrong with that. But you go, Brian, Brian, this guy remembers your dad. You got to meet him. And uh, I didn't know what you were talking about. You go, whatever, Joe, I want you to meet Brian Briscoe. Yes, I'd convinced him that you you were the son of Jack Briscoe, former world heavyweight champion. So there is some guy out there who was as drunk as I was who has pictures like in the middle of me and you, <laughs> like he wanted yes. pictures of us and he thought I was a, you Briscoe. signed, you signed an autograph for him. I did sign an autograph. I, I regretted it, but you kind of forced me to, I said, come on now, you know, he's a good fan. I know you don't like to sign <laughs> autographs. You don't want to make a big deal out of who you are. I feel bad about it. Cause this guy's going to go home thinking he has an autograph. So I'm like, I can't do this. And you just guilted me into doing something that was completely wrong. by signing an autograph saying I'm a Briscoe. But but anyway, but uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, what one time, if, if, me and Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane are in the car, and we're on the way to a show somewhere. And we stop at the Wendy's drive-through. Of course we did. And I'm driving, right? So I do the order. And I'm paying, and they see who we are. Oh, please, can we have your autograph? And I mean, t- still to this day, if you go to the Carolinas, if we go to the drive-through, somebody's going to recognize it. it's it's just it's bizarre. It's like we, you know, 
we never age or whatever. But anyway, just in that period of the part of the country. But anyway, can we have an autograph? Okay, uh, give us a piece of paper. So they hand the notepad out. I sign my autograph. I hand it to Stan. He signs his, hands it back to Bobby. Bobby writes on a pad. And as I'm handing it back in, Bobby has written, help me, call police. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as far as my... <laughs> My best post, I mean, there's been so many great post-match meals, either at great restaurants or just because I was starving to death. Uh, that time we went all the way out to Phoenix for the Ring of Honor uh, WrestleMania weekend when WrestleMania was in Phoenix. And I had worked a 12-hour day on the show the day, the, because they did two shows two days in a row. 12-hour day. And by the time that we got out of there, it was midnight and we're staying at a nice little place in a nice little, you know, ritzy neighborhood out there. But there was nothing to eat after midnight. I think we just had some kind of drive through shit and then went and did the afternoon show on Sunday. And I hadn't had a chance to eat anything else. So in like a 36 hour period, I'd had like a fucking fast food burger. We went to the heart attack grill and I knocked out the, the quadruple bypass, which was four half pound patties to get the free wheelchair ride. I knocked that out in 10 minutes and then had a half a stasis double and a bunch of all you can eat fries from the fry bar. That was well, you know, almost every meal I have after a long trying show is great. I used to go to the Philly diner after those HD net TV tapings for ring of honor and that shithole fucking ECW arena, but you wouldn't eat anything that came within 10 miles of that place. So I'd go out to back out of the airport and change my clothes in my room and go to the Philly diner down there. It's open 24 hours. And I would have two dinners and a breakfast at the same time, which of course was obviously very healthy, uh, but because I hadn't had time to eat in the previous fucking 24 hours. So I'd eat all my meals at one time. That's why I need to stay away from fucking wrestling business. I'm too old for that shit. That's what I do. I, I don't have time to eat. I'm not going to eat breakfast early in the morning, some fucking bullshit from a goddamn Hampton Inn, you know, at fake eggs. And then you're at a fucking building all day. You know, that's what MLW, they were bringing in pizza for the catering. Oh, that's all I need to do before I go out and scream for four hours under hot lights is eat some good acidic <laughs> pizza. Was you it, know, so I just was it good pizza at least. It would have been good pizza if I didn't have to go out and you know actually be physically active. I don't know how the guys weren't puking in the goddamn ring. Uh, so I just I wouldn't eat and I'd eat you know at fucking midnight somewhere. You know, go to goddamn Denny's or Waffle House, order everything on a fucking menu, and then go another twenty four hours without eating any food. You know, similar to the Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane, Wendy story you told before. I remember Austin Idol. The Universal Heartthrob telling me a story that when he was in the WWF in 73 as Iron Mike McCord, him and his wife would drive and sometimes George Steele would drive with them. And he said George Steele, when anyone would pull up next to them, he would just get in the window and make the face. Yeah. Every, every now and then mouth, help me. But you know, like, yeah. like he was really believable as that character. People were just like, what the hell's going on in that car? <laughs> Ah, uh, uh, good times. All right, well, let's get another question here, Jim. Well, now, now, but now we get to play video games. We can have all kinds of fun. But video games are good. See, I'm, I'm, I disagree with you on video games being a problem or not. I don't know if problem's the right word, but... Well, okay, you know, and I shouldn't it, paint with a broad brush, but it's just that it seems like so many of the annoying fucking wrestlers and so many of the annoying fucking wrestling fans to, of today live their whole lives around a fucking video game, whether they want to act like them or fucking be like them or fucking play them constantly or whatever the fuck, or I'm, have them on their profiles. I'm not disagreeing with you there, but there are games I think you would actually like. Red Dead Redemption and Red Dead Redemption 2, you would probably love. I, I actually watched, say that. I watch this, the people playing these things on clips on tele. I'm like, what the fuck? This looks like work. If I'm going to do something for fun, I don't want to work that hard. I, d you know, I wouldn't it, it, say it's work. It, it's you being able to, to, it's almost like a movie that you get to participate in. It's a Western. And I actually think you would tremendously enjoy that. You might enjoy now, Grand Theft Auto I, too, because you get to shoot people and crash into people and have sex with hookers. You may enjoy that one too. 
Well, I remember one one fucking movie I, I wished I'd have been in. It was Dumbo Does It Donkey Style was the name of the flick. But uh, <laughs> but normally I don't wish I was in movies. I just like to watch them. Okay, well, our next question here. Boy, what an episode this is. Was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Brad Stutz? Stutzy. You know this man. Brad Stutz from North Carolina. Okay, I didn't know if you yeah, were just applying a nickname he, to him. No, no, he's, he's the illegitimate son of Billy McGuire. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, it looks just like him. Well. I love you, Stutzy, I'm just kidding. Here's his question. I'm not kidding about you looking like Billy McGuire, but I like you anyway. Will you leave him alone? All right. What does Jim think would have been the possible top matches for Starcade 89 if they had gone with a traditional card instead of the Iron Man concept? Does Flair work with Muda? Possibly Flair versus Luger? Or in that scenario, do you just say Flair versus Funk, I quit for Starcade? Well, I wish I could tell you because. In a normal environment, we would have, I was on the booking committee and we would have thought of matches like that, except that, as I said a while back, as I remember being told by Jim Hurd, this is what we're going to do. You know, the round robin tournament, which killed Starcade and killed almost everybody in it. Uh, and Muda got beat three times in one night, um, which is why, which is pretty much when he started thinking about heading back home. Of course, Gary Hart was telling him, don't let him turn your baby face, brother, because Gary didn't want to lose his guy. But uh, yeah, Muda was like, fuck this. I can see where this is going. Um, you know, if we had been booking a Starcade card, I don't know if I would have pitched for Flair against Muda there because I wanted to see the match. But at the same time, Flair was a... It, th- Flair was a baby face, but Muda really didn't have, Muda was cool and didn't have a lot of fucking heat. I would have liked to have put more steam behind Muta and, and Flair as an issue, as an individual single issue before we pulled the trigger on it than what was there at that time. But I would have loved to have seen that match, just not at Starcade 89 in a round robin tournament. But I mean, you know, that's when, so many of the fucking guys had been signed to these guaranteed contracts and they knew what they were making, regardless of whether they drew or not, regardless of whether they were on top or not, regardless of whether they were on pay-per-view or not. That's when everybody was getting fucking, you know, hang nails and taken off if they didn't like what was going on. And it just ruined everybody's work ethic, guaranteed contracts, you know, guaranteed minimums are fine. Guaranteed contracts were garbage. And I had one too. And I'd earned every penny of it for putting up with Jim Hurd. But, um, it, you know, you used to have, oh, shit, if we get this done and, boy, and we really kick this in and we give, sell some fucking tickets, you know, it, you knew what your payoff was going to be, no matter whether you were the main event of Starcade or the first match of a fucking house show. You already knew what you were making, so there was no incentive whatsoever. That's what the, one of the first things that ruined the fucking business. Um. I don't know, but so anyway, what I was saying is every time we started an angle, remember skyscrapers and fucking whoever, then one of the skyscrapers would get hurt or Sid would want to play softball or somebody else would get hurt or somebody else would take off or this would happen or that would happen or Heard would get involved in something and it would screw up the program. So there was no, Dusty always knew by the summertime after he blew off shit in the Great American Bash, he knew what he was going to Starcade with. I had just gotten on the booking committee in what Septemberish, Octoberish. You know, they pretty much knew the direction of the November Clash of Champions at that time. And then, as you'll recall, it was news to Terry Funk when they announced that he would be, you know, if he lost the match, he w- he would be retiring from wrestling. It was news to him because Heard never he just decided he was going to move Terry into uh, commentating and announcing and fucking put him on the booking committee and take him out of the ring and. It was news to Terry, which led to the ill feelings that had Terry leaving early. Because Terry didn't mind fucking not wrestling for a while, but he didn't just say, what the fuck? You know, he never said, I'm just not going to wrestle anymore. Obviously. Even when he said he wasn't going to wrestle anymore, he still wrestled. Um, So there was no build to anything past month to month. What you could get past, heard, and get done, and book for the month. Because we would book 
30 to 40 days out so the cards could get advertised in the house shows. And by the time that we'd sit down to do the fucking, you know, next round, something would have changed. Somebody got mad. Somebody got hurt. Heard would have stuck his nose in. There was no build. So I don't know what I would have fucking done. I'd have to have a lot longer to fucking go back and give you something than sperm of the moment notice. Luger was a pretty hot heel coming out of not just that summer, but that clash of the champions where after the match, he destroyed the, what, wrestler of the year trophy, wrestler yes. of the decade trophy for Flair, yeah. most popular wrestler for Sting, and attacked everyone in the middle of that angle at the end of the match. That's probably the most over that Lex ever was, and he was a great heel. And then, of course, within, what, fucking January, three months, Sting got hurt and had to switch him back babyface, and I don't think Lex ever got that back again. His his matches were great. He was confident. He was a good heel. People were getting into it. And then, but the start of 19, basically 1990 started the downhill slide when Flair quit as Booker, switched Luger, Sting was hurt. We were marginalized. The fucking, then Ole came in with, he just said, well, we'll just bring in the cheap guys. Like he wanted to do what he did with the road warriors beforehand, just bring in a bunch of muscle guys and see if anything stuck. And so 90 was the downhill slide that they didn't recover from till 96. So it was, it was pretty brutal. That was the start of brutality. You know, I just started thinking about a program that I liked, which was, and Luger probably hated it, but Luger against Stan Hansen. <laughs> I had never asked you, what did you think of the Steiner Brothers Nasty Boys program? Well, it it was great because they were slobber knockers, as they say. Um, and you know, you definitely could tell they weren't classic smooth matches, but the nasty boys were, they were still okay. Then they hadn't become parodies and they were still working pretty hard. And, you know, it, they hadn't got into the whole fucking, you know, just we're Hogan sidekick thing. Cause the, you know, the mid nineties nasty boys was not the same as the early nineties nasty boys. Um, you know, it, so I liked it, but, you know, once again, they were at a period of time where if the match is great in the forest and there's nobody there to see it, is it any good? You know, it was just, that was the time period where nobody was watching WCW. Although, well, wait a minute, okay. <laughs> that was the dark days where nobody was watching WCW and it, the ratings on Saturday night were three to four times what AEW's is, but I digress. That match is my favorite Frankensteiner of all time. I think it's Jerry Sags gets hit with it. Yeah. And he just, he jumps, I want to say perfectly, but it's almost not perfectly because he perfectly lands right on his head. It's just yeah, he, brutal. Well, yeah. He tried, to, he tried to go with it like you would, not knowing that when Scott Frankensteiner, you back in those days, you were going with it whether you tried to or not. And so it was a little too much go. Uh, but you know, yeah, they, uh, they had some, they had some slobber knockers there, but I uh, ask, uh, Austin Idol sometime about working a program with Stan Hansen. Oh, I've talked God, about that. Yeah. The summer of 83, it was so fucking funny because Lawler's booking and Memphis did not do, I don't think they did less than 7,000 people on a Monday night from the end of May until the first part of September. But Lawler had 40 guys in the territory. And, you know, sometimes the opening match was a 10-man tag. And that's why, you know, at the end of the year, Jared had to take it back over and send guys to to Mid-South and put a yank a knot in his tail for a second because Jerry couldn't say no to anybody, and he loved to have big cards. <clears throat> and to be fair, they were running two towns a night in the territory during the summer of 83, almost everywhere except Memphis. You wouldn't split Memphis up. Actually, sometimes they did, and I was in fucking Water Valley, Mississippi. But... But anyway, um, Lawler brings in Jesse Ventura and Stan Hansen to just work Mondays and Tuesdays, Memphis and Louisville, the two biggest towns. And then they'd go to Lexington once a month for Rupp Arena on Thursdays. And so they'd go through Evansville that week. But Lawler's the one that got to work with Jesse Ventura because Jesse Ventura's work was rotten. I mean, let's, I mean, everybody I'm pretty sure knows this. He was a great promo and he looked like a million dollars, but he was a rotten worker, but he was easy. And I think that's actually if if the situation has, had been reversed and Lawler worked with Hanson and the other top babyface Austin Idol worked with Jesse Ventura, the houses would have been even bigger because Lawler and Hanson could have drawn some money because 
the people in Memphis just looked at Jesse Ventura and it's like, this, this is no. And they were, they were still doing that because it was a package show. <laughs> so they were still doing big business, but Jesse Ventura's work was not up to Memphis standards. But anyway, Lawler works the whole program with Ventura and there's the other top baby face, Austin Idol, and he was so hot. He was right on the heels of a Lawler and Dundee, handsome Jimmy Valiant fucking level baby face at that time. And he is getting a snot beat out of him by Stan Hansen every fucking Monday night and coming back with these welts and fist marks on his chest and fucking that <laughs> worried look on his face that he gets like, fuck. And I think that's why he finally left early that year. But I'm, but it was well, firing, you know, well, go ahead. Well, you probably know better because you've done his shows. Well, funny enough, when we had the old Austin Idol Live podcast, we had Stan Hansen on and they were talking about that program <laughs> and Idol would be like, oh, you know, Stan, oh, you were, you were stiff. You were rough in the ring. And Stan's like, yeah. And then you got me fired. He's like, oh, I didn't get you fired. He goes, yeah, you did. You know, like he just, <laughs> it was really funny hearing them talk about that feud. I, I just found it funny that Lawler never worked with Hanson and he was the booker, but, uh, but yeah. And that's the time they brought handsome Jimmy back into the six man and sold out. Um, they'd been doing big business anyway. And I think the program was Lawler and idol against the assassins, Roger Smith and Donnie Bass. And they put, it was Ken Patera. They put on the other side, not Jesse Ventura. Ken Patera was on the side of the assassins. And they announced that because Han Handsome Jimmy had been in the Carolinas for like a year, year, a year, year and a half, as Handsome would say. And they announced Monday night, Handsome Jimmy Valiant returns to team with the King and the Universal Heartthrob. And the fucking place was jammed 11,200 or whatever, just uh, based on Handsome sending in a tape saying, I'm coming to get you. And they announced his name on Saturday morning and Monday night, the fucking place was sold out. It was goddamn insane. That's why Lawler and Jarrett bought fucking handsome a house in Memphis to stay in the territory at that time. And he did for about six months and then Crockett made him a heck of a deal. And so he went and he dropped the fucking keys to the house back in Lawler's fucking mailbox said, sorry guys, gotta go. And they ended up having to sell the house to get their fucking money back. Well, let's get a few more questions before we wrap things up here this week, Jim. Let's stay on the topic briefly of your time on the booking committee. This question was sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from Farley in Farkville. Farley in Farkville? Farley, that's what it says here. Not, it's not Charlie from Starkville. It certainly it's isn't. Farley the, from Farkville. Farley from Farkville. I, can, I know the email address. It's not Charlie's. All right. Whose idea was it to name woman, woman? And what was their thought process? If she debuted today, would they call her person? <laughs> it was Ric Flair. As I recall, maybe it may have been Kevin Sullivan. It was, it was at that time. No, you know what? Didn't she become woman before Flair took over the book? It may have been Kevin. I don't think, no, I don't think she did become, she was Robin Green before flair took over the book i don't think they executed the angle yeah but it was flair always going to go in that direction but basically i mean all of us were fully behind it because let's face it at that time nancy was the hottest fucking woman in the business and it just it, instead of this robin green which was to sucker the simple-minded rick steiner into having a crush on her so that she would lead him astray and then end up showing that she was this wily woman she was woman she was the woman just like flair was the man that was the thought process behind it because she was the hottest fucking woman in the wrestling business, bar none. There was nobody even close. And what else would you look at that woman? There you go. That's I, where it came from. I know about the heat between Eddie Gilbert, who left the booking committee when you were added to it, and Ric Flair, and I guess even Eddie and Kevin Sullivan. What do you know about the stuff with Missy? Because obviously Missy was sent home. I mean, you talk about the hottest woman in wrestling. Missy's right up there at that period of time with Nancy and all of a sudden she just wasn't being used at all. Was there a lot of heat between the Kevin Sullivan and Nancy camp and Eddie and Missy? Uh, I hope I missed most of it. Um, if there was, um, you know, Missy had been somehow placed in a position to be in a baby face, probably because Eddie wanted her to be a baby. Face. I don't fucking know, but that was just wrong for Missy. So, and also, what Nancy was new. 
so I can see where with all the other things with the outside the ring drama and, you know, Flair was just down on Eddie and Flair being down on Eddie, he probably didn't want to help the fucking family out at all. But, you know, but at the same time, I can understand in some cases why Flair was mad at Eddie for, you know, he, he changed that finish in Memphis and Flair just went ballistic. Cause Flair, you know, there's Ron Simmons, you know, Florida state, all American, big fucking massive guy. He's going to, you know, he's pushing him and he sent the finish to Memphis at the Coliseum and Eddie was on the booking committee. Flair wasn't there. And Eddie either thought, well, this must be a mistake because this is Memphis or I'm just going to change it. So he changed it and either did something else or went over Ron or whatever. Didn't put Ron over. And Flair himself cited that to me as this, the last straw with this fucking guy. He called me on the phone. He said, you want to be on a booking committee? I'm like, hamana, hamana, hamana. He said, I'm going to make some changes. And then he said, and you know, this guy changed to a fucking finish. Cause it, cause let's face it. Flair did not give a shit about the city and he was born there, but he didn't give a shit about the city of Memphis, Tennessee as a whole, when he's booking all of WCW. And if it had been Lawler, it'd been one thing, but you know, that's, I think Flair even mentioned, he said, this guy thinks he's fucking Lawler. He can't be beaten Memphis. What the fuck? You know how Rick gets when he gets on something. It's like when he fired Paul Lee that time, he was sitting there in front of the monitor. <clears throat> when he had told Paul to go out and say he was scouting talent and he was on a worldwide search and he was going to bring in some great talent. Paul went out there and did a, Hell of a three-minute fucking promo, but it was only appealing to the sheet readers at the time because he was dropping in all the inside references, and and he gave Flair a little sideways knock without mentioning his name or just talking about management or whatever that, you know, the sheet readers would get a kick out of, and being Paul, and it was great, and nobody at home would know there was anything wrong, but it wasn't what Flair told him to say. And there's Flair sitting there at the monitor. And every time Paul finishes a sentence, he's like, who is this fucking guy? Is this fucking guy somebody I'm not aware of? Can somebody tell me who the fuck this guy is? And he just walk, he's looking around like, how the fuck does he just go out and say whatever the fuck he wants to? Who is this fucking guy? Does he think he's somebody? <laughs> and, God, God. and we're all just standing there going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, twiddling our thumbs. And finally, Paul, you know, blows off the interview and comes back through and Flair goes out to meet him. And I said, well, I got to see this. I've told this story, but maybe there's a new audience. So in center stage, when you'd come back from the ring and stage area where the set was and everything, you would come into this backstage area and all of the doors, it was like a round kind of semi round area and all the doors to the various locker rooms and everything were on the right and on the left was a slanted ceiling with girders every so often so that you would hide behind, right? It's the inside of a, in a kind of mini arena. And so as Flair goes through the door to meet Paul Lee, I just went through the door behind him and I just stood behind one of the fucking, you know, little separations thing and under the slanted ceiling. To hear this, just in case there needed to be fucking evidence given in court. And Paul Lee comes around the corner and Flair points at him and says, you're done. And Paul says, okay, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Like you're done for the day. He said, Flair said, no, I mean, you're fucking done. <laughs> you're fucking fired. What the fuck? You go out there and say anything you want to do. Who the fuck do you think you are? You're fucking done. And Flair turns around and goes back in the fucking room and slams the fucking door. And Paul doesn't know I'm there and he can't see me. And he waits a full 10 seconds after the door has slammed. And then he picks up a plastic garbage can and throws it at said door that Flair's just gone into. And the story became that Flair fired him and he threw a garbage can at him. Oh my God, I was fucking dying. I'm like, what the fuck? I should have known then 30 years ago, I needed to be a goddamn seamstress or something and well, not get this <laughs> i don't know about that but a couple more questions before we wrap things up jim and all right one from this time period although the question says bret hart negotiating with wcw in 1992 you'll see in a second why i think maybe he's referring to this period of time there were a lot of rumors we've discussed them on john arezzi's pro wrestling spotlight then and now we're covering this period of time in 1989 the original broadcast dave Meltzer's on some of those shows john talks about what's been on uh, in the news and what rumors he's hearing. So with that said, let me read you the question here. Hi, Jim and Brian. Recently, I was watching a shoot interview with Bret Hart where he mentioned that following losing the Intercontinental title to the Mountie in January 1992, he spoke with Brian Pillman, 
who mentioned he can get a better deal in WCW than what he was currently getting in the WWF. Brett stated that he spoke to Jim Barnett and later Kevin Sullivan, and ultimately they were unable to offer him a better deal. Brett was also upset over rumors getting out to the dirt sheets, and thus he stayed where he was. So I guess the question is, not talking necessarily with the 92 negotiation, because you would have had no involvement whatsoever in any of that. Yeah, I, I wasn't even there. Do you remember? Because he mentioned, and Kevin Sullivan wasn't there either. So that's what made me think back to 1989, Jim Barnett and Kevin Sullivan he spoke to. Do you remember any talks while you were on the booking committee about Bret Hart potentially coming in? Because it was a big rumor in wrestling. You know, I think somebody's asked me this before. And no, I don't really. But then again, why would I? Because to me in 1989, Bret Hart was not the answer to anything. Bret Hart and Jim the Anvil Neidhart had been the WWF tag team champions. I didn't watch WWF. Even back then, it was too cartoony. So it wasn't until Bret started being pushed as a single in the early 90s and started having those great matches that, uh, and didn't he and Henning have a fucking, just a hell of a match at SummerSlam 91, one year? 1991. That, yeah. You know what? That's when Bret Hart got over with me because Bobby Eaton and I was still living in Charlotte and Bobby was still working for WCW, but I had quit, me and Stan. And I went over to Bobby's house and he said, did you see this? And we watched that match. And Bobby was just thrilled with both of them. And I was too. And I said, wow, that was, so that's when... Bret Hart started to be somebody to me. It would have just been to me in 1989, to be honest, a former WWF tag team guy, you know, wanting to come in. Bret Hart was not really, you know, that big a deal to me. So I wouldn't have remembered it. Um, so I don't really remember it. There may have been talks. Who the fuck knows? I know that after heard fuck Tully and Arn, those, we never had any other talks from anybody that actually had a job in WWF wanting to come there because, Heard had poisoned the well. Basically, Flair had made the deal for Tully and Arn to come back from the WWF and reform the Horsemen, which would have done tremendous at the time because people were longing for a call back to the old days when the shit was any good. And Heard had agreed to it, and then Tully and Arn finish up at Survivor Series. Tully flunks the drug test and the WWF on the way out. Heard hears about it and won't hire Tully at all for any amount of money, because he flunked a fucking drug test in another company, even when I suggested, it's the first time I ever heard Jim Ross use the phrase, are you going to die on that hill? When I wouldn't stop browbeating Jim Hurd, how about you send him to rehab and then put out a press release saying you sent a fucking wrestler to rehab and turned his life around? And that made too much sense. That's why Hurd would harumph it. I hated that motherfucker. I wanted to pull his eyeballs out. But anyway... So he fucks Tully on the contract and ends Tully's major league wrestling career. And because Arn was not as valuable to him as a single as he was in a tag team, he cut Arn's salary by a hundred grand and only offered him 150 when Arn had already agreed to 250 and fucked Arn. And Arn had no place to go to make that money now because he'd given it notice to the WWF. So I'm surprised that Arn didn't fucking pull Jim Hurd's eyeballs out. And after that, nobody in the WWF except people who knew they were going to be fired or had already been fired would contact WCW until Heard was gone, which was another couple of years. So that's another thing he did for us. So what was the question? Bret Hart and WCW. I don't fucking know. How about that? Our final question here this week on the drive through sent in to Courtney drive through at gmail.com from Austin Tussey in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville. Wanted to see your thoughts on John Cena tweeting that Brock Lesnar is the greatest WWE performer of all time. Seems a bit far-fetched to me, but maybe I'm just being worked. Well, let's examine this. I mean, he's not the greatest pro wrestling performer of all time. Um, you know, or even in the WWF, maybe Shawn Michaels in ring would be the best. But as far as Working his gimmick, not doing anything stupid, not being involved in any gaga, making more money than anybody else, projecting an aura of realism and credibility and staying in a main event spot. Can you think of anybody else that may have done better? Well, greatest of all time. I mean, again, you're looking at guys well, like Hogan, he, The Rock, okay, Austin. But, but greatest at what? It says performer. Hogan, Hogan, okay. Hogan was nowhere near the greatest performer. Well, so, but the, Hogan, the Rock, Hogan was almost purely performance. 
in the WWF. But yes, but he wasn't very good at it, but he drew a million fucking dollars. The Rock was at one time Rocky Maivia. So if, if, as far as just being presented as, as a top guy from start to finish, never doing hokey, did he ever do any hokey funny shit, Brock? He has done some silly shit, but the stuff I could think of was kind of in character so that it made sense. Like him doing a mariachi dance when he was feuding with Eddie Guerrero it wasn't a backstage segment. It to was... taunt Eddie Guerrero. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I don't think that counts. Uh, to be a prick about it. Um, I, you know, and John, obviously, John was never in the goddamn, you know, ring with fucking Bruno. Or never in the ring with fucking, well, I don't think Pedro would qualify anyway, but you know what I'm saying. But as far as what John knows, and since they came up together, and he's worked with him so many times, but when you think about it, the greatest performer has any number of meanings, but a guy who came in being presented as a top guy has never been presented as anything but a top guy, has kept the aura all this time of being a top guy, and ended up in a spot where he makes more money than anybody else because he's real and has has been allowed to be real and is the only real thing left in wrestling, has gotten through completely unscathed by Vince's and his company's bad booking on his own fucking terms, he may be the best of all time. Think about it. I don't know. Apparently you're thinking about it right now. I'm thinking about it. I mean, he's really good, and I think he's... I think there's a lot of little things he does that he's exceptional at. I think his selling when he actually sells. Yeah, when he when he it does looks real. Sell, it yeah. looks real because he just fucking throws himself out of the ring. There's no art to it. He just figures nothing can hurt me. So he takes those fucking wild ass uncontrollable fucking bumps. He's always been like that. Um you know, except for the diverticulitis, did he have a major ever have a major injury that kept him out of of the wrestling business at least any length of time? You know, and I mean, I don't like Brock as a person. Everything about him, I don't like. He hunts, kills animals for fun. I, I hate that. He's been a prick to a variety of friends of mine. Um, married Sable. He married Sable. <laughs> you know, there you taste there. What the fuck? Um, but but no, as far as being a genetic freak and a beast and having been presented from start to finish of his career, the career that he wanted to win, and he, he got a million dollar spot in the wrestling business, walked away from it, quit the business, and then came back and made more money. You know, the fucking guy, um, he's found the fucking, he's found the answer. He's found the equation. So greatest at what? No, he's not the greatest promo. He never gives them. No, he's not the greatest in-ring wrestling performer, but the greatest as far as from start to finish, making more money, having a better win-loss record, having better booking, being real, being the same gimmick with no fucking foolishness, keeping his own name. What else, What more? I'm surprised he doesn't get a fucking free blowjob every time he shows up at the arena. What else could you want? You don't know that he doesn't. He probably does. And he still doesn't like the wrestling business and just does it for the money. So what a classic fucking heel. Nothing about him is likable. And well, you know, you know my connection with the romantics. I've told this story. Was this before you got on the program? Have I ever told you this? I don't know if I know it, but I'm I'm reading here actually in his note. It's not a karaoke track. It's not a muddy mix. It's not recorded from Cletus Maggots or Maggard's <laughs> karaoke machine. And unless I'm making shit up entirely, I seem to recall Jim talking about going to dinner with romantics courtesy of Rick Rubin. Which also well, makes he, this he, a deep he, cut. He's mixing his stories up a bit, but I will I will explain. But what's his name again? Josh Hughes. Josh Hughes, bravo, Josh. That was a piece of business right there, as they say. No, um, the romantics we met in 1987, I believe. Here's what it used to, uh, when we would take trips in the Carolinas, in the car, we would meet, all the boys would meet at the Holiday Inn on Woodlawn Avenue and drop their cars off so they'd get in with their rides. And then you come back, that was right off the interstate, and then you'd go to your various separate homes, right? So one night, me and Bubba get back real late from Raleigh. I don't know why we would have been lingering around Raleigh, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, we get back, it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and we had gone in Bubba's van. He had one of those, you know, panel vans. That literally, he glad he wasn't selling ice cream out of it. 
And he pulls up next to my car and I get out and we're pulling our bags out. And all of a sudden out of this other van, a door flies open and four or five guys jump out and start running toward us. And we, oh shit, shit's on. They've recognized us. And Bubba's turned around getting ready to fight. I'm like, thank God Bubba's here. Cause there's like five of them. So the odds are fairly even without me having to get involved. It was the romantics and their manager, Arnie Tenser. They had played a, a club date in Charlotte earlier that night. And the last time they had been in Charlotte, they had stayed at the Holiday Inn on Woodlawn and they had seen wrestlers getting out in the parking lot after their late show. And they, so they had staked the parking lot out. They were sitting in their van. <laughs> wow. I swear to God, if I'm lying, I'm flying and my feet ain't left the ground. We have pictures with them. <laughs> um, it, th this was, you know, uh, yeah, 1987, because Bubba was still around. And so, you know, fuck us, they said, oh, we love you guys. We love you guys. We're the romantics. And they had to show us their publicity pictures and tell us this story of how they came to be there for us to believe them, right? So then, you know, basically, they, you know, we were the only ones, I guess, they saw that night because they got out later, whatever. <laughs> but anyway... So Arnie gave me his, his number and they were based out of Detroit. And so then, then we started going to Detroit for Crockett. Cause that 87 was when they switched the uh, belt from flair to Garvin at Joe Lewis arena. Yeah. We would start going there and they were fixed up with the people at the landing strip at the Detroit airport. And the landing strip was a fine adult entertainment establishment for good food and wonderful, bountiful titties. So, you know, they say, oh, we'll fix you up. So goddamn me and Stan and Bubba and Bobby, we go up the next time and they take us all to the landing strip. And Bobby Eaton is hilarious. Stan Lane was well, well at home in a strip club, right? So he knew exactly what was going on. Bobby Eaton was hilarious to see him get a lap dance. The only time in my life I ever saw that. And, you know, they fixed us up and the fucking food and the girls and the whole nine yards. And anytime we would go up, we, you know, we would get them tickets and et cetera. And then, you know, we stopped going to Detroit and I guess the romantics stopped playing together. And, you know, I've stayed in touch with Arnie for a, a short time, but then I was involved in Smoky Mountain and we grew apart, as they say. And then I'll be a son of a bitch when you know who won the pony. When I go back to Detroit and it was probably 2000, what was it, eight-ish or nine-ish or whatever for Ring of Honor. I see a guy and I'm like, what the fuck? And it's been 20 years, right? But I see a guy, I'm like, what? I, I know you. He said, Jim, it's Arnie Tenser. Instead of managing rock and roll bands now, he was the owner of a giant fucking seafood market. And he gave me his card. He said, if you need some seafood, come down and see me. I'm like, she sells seafood by the seashore, right? But Arnie was selling seafood in Detroit still, but and I guess doing better than the Romantics because they haven't had a hit in a few decades. But, but yeah, very good. Deep cut. Nod to the past, lyricism, musicianship. I say we get to fuck out here. Leave on the high note. George Costanza. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll, I'll see you. Finish the show, Brian. I'm done. Boy, this is their perfect time to get out. And bye now, bye. And now I'm craving seafood, but of course, you can hear the drive through any experience anytime you want on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, tinyurl.com slash official corny YouTube, or just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll come right up. You can hear the experience when it debuts back on Friday. Now that we're all somewhat healthy, back on Friday this week. Speak for yourself, bucko. And we'll be back next week here with the drive through on its normal Monday release day. Of course, you can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. You can follow Bucko on Twitter at <laughs> Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com. If you have made an order in the last week, he is getting ready Let's say, to ship it out. Okay, here, here's, here's the goddamn deal. To be honest, if you have ordered since January the 28th, when I began, when I began coming down with this, uh, about 20 packages are in the mail. About another 80 are going, well, have already, have already been in the mail by the time this airs, Monday morning, and the rest will be out on Tuesday, and then we'll be caught up with everything from, say, February 6th through the 10th by the uh, middle or end of this week, and then we're, we're back to a regular rotation. I appreciate the consideration. That's Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. Don't forget, if you need to sue, call Stephen P. New, 
692-8084 or visit newlawoffice.com. He is the man for you, the conciliary to the cult of Cornette, Stephen P. New. But until next week on The drive Through and this Friday on The Experience, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!